There wasn't vain the warmer welcome if there's travel fur and wide. The cousin have a better comrade than a butty by your side. For the forest's heaven on earth, every man to know his worth. Singing obis the old butty, and obis gwine on. Obis gwine on, obis gwine on. Singing obis the old butty, and obis gwine on. The Forest of Dean. Heaven on earth, as Keith Morgan says in his Forest National Anthem. But what is this place really like? And who are these people that enjoy such fanatical praise? Here, between the Severn and the Wye, belonging to neither north nor south, east nor west, yet inexplicably and intangibly savouring of them all. Harbouring through the years rebels from all quarters, trading legally or illegally by land or water with all comers, grimly defending their independence from the time they poached the king's deer to the present day as they defend their commoners' rights. They have developed a character, a dialect and a humour all their own. So too with the forester's thoughts, salted with that sense of humour, mellowed in the balm of long sunny days, yet warily weighed and assessed in the light of their hard and often bitter history. Unpalatable they may be to some, but as you are about to hear, they carry with them not only the full flavour of their practical forest origin, but also a warm and affectionate pride in their past. Well, there we are, ladies and gentlemen. That's a, quite a start, isn't it? The voice of uh, Keith is with me on my right, and uh, he preceded Harry Bedditton himself, and that was quite a... Uh, a statement about the Forest of Dean and its people, and I think that's probably what makes him so attractive, his, um, his, his ability to represent the forest humorously and seriously is, uh, is his legacy. Um, what we're going to do this evening, and uh, Jason sort of suggested the outline, is we're going to, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Harry Beddington's biography. Um, Doug's going to talk um, as a publisher and a bookshop owner about his, his his um his friendship with Harry Beddington. Uh, we're going to have another clip, and then Keith is going to um, he's going to read some poems and actually talk again about his his relationship with Harry and uh, and his insights into his work. Um, we've got a break, a tea break, and then after the break, we've got some of Jason's ex friends. They used to be his friends, uh, but they've fallen out with him quite badly because he's. Um, He's persuaded them to come. Um, that's Rachel Griffiths, um, who is related to him, uh, Sarah Morris, Lee Beard, and Jeremy Gazard. And they've been rehearsing a play that um, uh, Harry wrote several, we think, but we've only, there's only one that was actually published called Footing the Bill. So they're going to present that play um, uh, in uh, a spoken form. Um, and that, that, that will come after the break. We listen to the feedback there are some people who have been to three of our talks and in fact you will get a long service good conduct medal uh, for doing that when we uh, when we look at your attendance because that's remarkable but those those people have given us feedback and we'll be looking for feedback during the interval this time as well we, we leave forms you should have one um, and if you could fill it in towards the end um, that'd be helpful but we listened to that feedback and people said they wanted more scope for discussion and we think that particularly tonight that'd be a good idea because um, we've had lots of sort of interesting questions about who was Jolter, um, you know, Harry Beddington's life. And we got the privilege of having four members of his family here who might be able to contribute as well. So we think that's really important. So after the play, we're going to have a, a fairly, uh, fairly good opportunity for a discussion. Um, so, so that's more or less the structure. But as before, as people who've been before know, we intersperse that with some recordings as well if we can. We've got we've got quite a few. We're really pleased. It's almost a pity not to play them all. But Jason's made me, me and Dane promised us not to make you listen to them all. But it really is worth it. They're excellent. Um, 
So where do we start? Well, I suppose who is Harry Beddington? Um, and I think there's many people who will know him or know of him. Um, and um, it, the basic facts, he was born on the 29th of May 1901. He died on the 27th of September 1986 in Lincolnshire, um, where his son lived. He's buried in Yew Tree Break Cemetery. Um, his wife's buried with him there. Um, her name was Ethel Mildred Wheel um, before he married her in 1928. He lived at 119 Bellevue Road, just up the road. Um, I think somebody ought to do a sort of literary trail at this road because you've got Leonard Clark uh, not far away. Um, um, what do we say about his career? Well, it's quite interesting because most people, their, their reaction to sort of hearing Harry Beddington or reading his books, you know, he's got to be a miner, he's got to be a farmer, you know, he's, he's a, a man of the people. And in fact, he was a very well-educated educational administrator. Um, he came to work in 1920 as a clerk in the office of what was called the school's manager. And this was a body that carried out the equivalent of the local education authorities' functions today, although I don't think they even exist anymore. We've moved on from that, haven't we? Um, but that type of function, so it was really administrating education in the Forest of Dean. Um, he was in, very interested in a lot of things. and In fact, he, he started to train as an architect doing a part-time degree, um, and that was cut short by the Second World War. So clearly one of his aspirations was to be an architect um, what well, he never fulfilled, but something it shows perhaps his interest in landscape and the buildings. He retired in 1966, um, and three years later, the things that he did were moved to Shire Hall. Um, and in fact, his serious writing uh, in the 1960s, that's when he wrote Forest Acorns, Forest Humour, that were later in the 1970s amalgamated into one book. Um, he wrote those in the 60s, so he's he was, a, again, like some of the authors we've discussed at other of these meetings, he came to writing uh, quite late in terms of publications, but he was a performer. And we know that as early as 19, the 1950s, he was actually um, taking part in events, um, telling stories, um, amusing people. So he had a great skill as a performer, which he was using a long time before he, he became a writer. But there were two aspects to Harry I just want to mention. One is his, his professional persona. Um, and there's, a, there's an interesting testament to that in um, a book, um, an educational compendium that came out in the early 1970s. And it dealt with educational figures in Gloucestershire. And this is about H.J. Beddington. In 1970 came the final meeting of the Forest of Dean group, Dean group of managers, so ending a body which came to, into existence in 1903. The administrative side of the school's growth had no more faithful servant during its history than Harry J. Beddington. As already recorded, the first clerk was Mr. J.S. Bradstock, who was a solicitor when the county council rule began in 1903. That's when the schools were brought under the governance of the county council. Um, in 1920, Harry, young Harry Beddington took office as a clerk. He soon made himself a useful assistant and with the with the office holders failing health, more and more of the school's management business fell to his lot. It's appropriate for that when, appropriate therefore that when Mr. Bradstock died in 1926, Harry J. Beddington was appointed as his successor. And this is the interesting bit. For the next 40 years, he steered a succession um, school manage, of school managers through a tricky, the tricky waters of ed, ed, administrating education in the Forest of Dean a task which he performed with great tact and in his innate forest humour. Few, right. Few local government officers can have been seen more changes than he had. And it goes on, it pays tribute to him, talks about the changes in the forest um, and his retirement. But it really is um, a remark an acknowledgement of a sort of remarkable career um, running the schools. And it, it, it links very neatly to his comments about education in forest humour. Um, but what about the, the sort of the, the man as Cinderford knew him? Well, um, uh, in 1965, I think it is, Cinderford's Women's Institute produced a scrapbook. Um, it's in this library. It's a wonderful archival document of what Cinderford was like at that time. And there's a lovely piece about Harry J. Bennington. It says he was born at Rusbridge, Cinderford, and he lived here all his life, a true avorister, is keenly interested in local dialect and first began writing plays 
both one and three act for the local amateur dramatic group in 1944. In 1944, his play, Footing the Bill, won the County Festival Award. He followed this with the publication of two books of forest dialect stories. The first included some of his humorous verses, and the second was enhanced by his line drawings of local beauty spots. In his daily life, Harry Beddington is official correspondent to the Forest of Dean Primary School Managers and clerk to the governing bodies of the secondary school, a position from which he will retire next year after 46 years of his service to education in the Forest of Dean. He is married with three children and five grandchildren. For many years, an acting member of the Mintech Players, his other interests included the writing of full-length children's stories, sketching which we can see around us, reading, and, and I love this, just wandering. So that's m more of a personal biography of Harry Bennington. So it tells us a little bit about his professional persona and a little bit about his, his personal persona, and we might hear more about that from, from his family later on. Um, but Harry Bennington has become this sort of uh, a big literary figure um, to all of us who live in the Forest of Dean, and uh, certainly he's... he's, he's those two um, books I mentioned earlier were amalgamated in the 70s and published in this book. Uh, one of the people that knew him at that time is, um, is Doug, who I've just surprised having a drink. <laughs> um, and people who came to our first talk know we asked Doug to reflect on a little bit on um, Winifred Foley. And Doug, do you think you could perhaps reflect a bit on Harry Beddington and his writing for us? I certainly could, yes. Um... Where do I start? Well, I, I think I first met Harry in the 1980s. Um, in fact, it was the early 1980s. And I picked up his um, book. It was published by the Forest of the Newspapers. Then, the, um, this one, Forest Humour. Uh, I managed to get a second-hand copy of uh, Forest Acorns later on, signed by him. But this one, I, I got him to sign as well. And uh, I just wanted to read what all this uh, this forest humour was about. Well, it, I didn't have to read very far to, uh, as in many occasions, laugh out loud at the at the book. He describes, for instance, to anyone who wants to find the forest, I suggest that him to follow the Severn down to Gloucester to him to get to Elton Corner, just past Westbury, and then turn right and start climbing. It's up in the air, a bit in mind, but it's worth the climb... If thou canst get somebody to give thee a ride, and when thou to get to the top, thou'll get some marvellous views. If thou to look due west, thou can see a whole range of Welsh mountains stretched before thee. And if thou turn round and look east, thou cousin't. <laughs> And it's those sort of staccato jokes that keep coming. Some are, some are funny, some are critical, some are bitter, some are t joyous. But he captures what the forest is, in not just about the dialect. It's about the people, it's about the landscape, it's about the geology. It's about this little heart-shaped um, area between, betwixt the Severn and the Wye, as Dennis Potter so aptly described. And... Harry Bennington was right at was living this in the 1960s uh, when he wrote this. And uh, he, he lived and enjoyed so much his community and his people, um, he decided to write, write this, this book, a collection of the forest humour, which is an essence of, uh, of forest. And I've, uh, Keith has made me laugh just with that just so uh, kind of forest humour, just in everyday language, just comes up with these little quips, which I'm glad to see is still alive. He may come, with, come up with a few later on tonight. But um, so why did he write it in dialect? It's a very tricky thing to do. To be, it's the consistency of the spelling. It's the um, um, do it doing it with respect too. Now people like Shakespeare, uh, Harper Lee, all wrote in dialect. But the b dialect was brought in, not just accent, dialect, you know, changing the language, changing the word order, the syntax that, uh, th that uh, gives foresters um, um, a sense of being at home when they hear it spoken again. Um, 
And I briefly brushed last time at the Winifred Foley talk of how Winnie was in the in her early days of being famous, was in London um, on a panel of speakers. And uh, she was sat down feeling very nervous about this, this big wide world of broadcasting. And she heard a voice behind her saying, hello, old butt. <laughs> and that was Edna Healy, the wife of the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, who comes from Coulthard. And, um, and just what made uh, Edna say that and what made uh, um, uh, when he feels so good about that is just that hearing that little touch of that lovely landscape and area and peoples that she, she grew up with and, and loved. And I think, like many foresters, Harry Beddington was one of those people that loved the, the area. Um, you wouldn't think it, too, just thinking of something else, that uh, I have a sympathy with that and empathy. Because I was brought up speaking quite a broad dialect a real dialect. It's called Doric in the, in the northeast of Scotland. I've lost my accent now. I've lost all that. But I still remember the dialect and I can still go back there and speak the dialect to other di still living <laughs> but dialect speakers. And I, c I f remember that feeling every time I went back there and heard the dialect. This warm glow that you feel that I belong somewhere and the, um, it's it's part of the landscape, the mountains, the sea. I see all that as soon as I hear that, um, that those dialect words spoken. Not, a, not a, like hearing a Lancashire accent to a Lancastrian or a Yorkshire accent to a Yorkshire person. It's the, the language, it's like almost half a foreign language that you speak. So I know exactly what uh, Harry is doing. He's not going to write in English. He's going to have that dialect coming out of the pages and it succeeds beautifully in this poetic, almost biblical language that he uses in his, his writing. Um, he wanted some memories. I must uh, repeat the memory I had last time of, uh, um, we did several functions together, often with Keith in tow as well, um, going around giving talks to communities or presenting, or doing readings and books. And I was traveling back from uh, something in Colford that I'd arranged I think it might have been even that uh, 1981 one at the Angel. And uh, we were all talking together, and uh, Winnie was chatting, and Harry was chatting. They both loved to chat. And um, uh, somehow, within the com context of the com uh, conversation, I said, oh, you know, I, I really wish I was a forester. And they both chimed up at once, saying, Doug, you are a forester. <laughs> and I was dubbed at the there. I'm very proud of that, and I always remember that, that I was dubbed a forester by um, Harry Bennington and Winnie Fo Foley. Is that enough to be dubbed by them, or do I have to do something else? <laughs> I've lived here since the late 1960s, so but it, I don't think it's really enough, do you? Um, was yes, that Doug. Yeah, I mean, w you, on that subject of, uh, of uh, dialect and uh, the book, um, just a, well, one one observation before I ask you a difficult question is that um, uh, the first book he we see the illustrations around us that um, Harry Beddington illustrated his own book Forest Acorns, but he turned to Eric Rice, which people might know was the he was the teacher mm. at Lydney Art School, and he illustrated the book that, as it were, combines his earlier works. Do you know why he did that? Was that was that like, do you think that was a publisher's decision or? No, I don't. I, I, I should imagine Harry, because he was an educationalist, um, uh, I should imagine Harry knew Eric. Eric so he mm. met him and talked to him and had a lot in, com uh, in, in common with him. So I think he would have asked uh, him to illustrate uh, his books, although Harry himself has done a couple of the illustrations, draw, uh, drawings in in the uh, in his own forest humour, mm. but the the two chaps, uh, Cotton and Chatting, in the um, okay. Doug. Yeah. One of the things, um, you know, I reading the book, um, and obviously writing in dialect makes it harder to read if you, if you're not a forester, if you haven't if you haven't got the dialect. I mean, it does have a tendency to sort of limit the scope of the book in terms of the readership. It's a sort of it's it's a bit like writing a book in Welsh. 
you know you're just going to attract people that can read it yeah. um, and there's so at some point you know perhaps you and Keith can explain that to me because it seems to me quite a chancy thing to write a book in dialect although it, it's it is a readable dialect but it's still it seems to me if you're going to write something yeah, you as I said at the beginning, it's, it's very tricky for anyone writing in dialect to to capture that and without making uh, it demeaning the per the person you're writing about because yeah. the, the habit of writers in the past is to show less educated people um, than the uh, uh, than the rest of the people that are in like Dickens mm. did and um, I believe just by bringing in the misspelling and the spelling phonetically. Uh, he doesn't do that. Mm. He captures as closely as, as he can the, the actual pronunciation and the, the way that foresters use their words, or they did in the old days. It's becoming less and less now, I think. But um, that, that's the skill in this book. Now, it's, it's of interest to linguists, to historians, to uh, sociologists, all sorts of people. It's kind yeah. of why it's multifaceted. Okay. Uh, he had his best voice, yeah. but on stage he would use a very, very authentic uh, forest miners dialect. Yeah. Keith, he knew the, you know, the people he grew up with. Yeah. Keith, did you want to pick yeah. up? Yeah. Can I just say that you know, getting back to the the dialect, the unique thing about this book is that the whole lot is written in forest dialect. Mm. Um, it's not all humour. A lot of it is quite serious points Harry mm. makes, but it's all written in dialect. It's very, very difficult to do. It's hard enough to write in po poetry in dialect mm. because there are always arguments as to what words are correct and what you spell wrong and this sort of thing. But to write, I've tried it myself to write. I've done a few short letters to the, the paper in dialect, which, and it, it's quite difficult to do, and mm. it, that's what makes this unique. The, the whole lot is written in dialect because people tend to associate dialect with humour. Now, mm. if you look at the little book of poems I wrote, whenever I wanted to write a, a poem about a serious subject, it's written in Queen's English. Mm. Mm. As soon as you write, I write a, a, a humorous one, I revert back to dialect. Yeah. And it's only the dialect ones that people remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we'll. Um, you, you're going to. I'd like you when you do your after the next clip then it'd be really good for you to talk about more about the dialect thing just one last observation and picking up on what you said this, there is some very serious stuff here yeah. there's criticism of the pope religion right. education, education yeah. um there's quite a thing one of the things that struck me was that if you do look at the scrapbook here um from 1965 you realize what a lovely town cinderford was because you've got all this modernization and you know destruction of um um, you know, I suppose it was modernity at the time, and he must have felt something about that. And maybe it was the, because certainly the school stuff, which he was very close to, he obviously feels very angry about those changes. Mm. It's a, it's quite a, a, a political book in terms of feeling quite angry about the way things were changing. But we're, we're pressing, we've got to press on because where's where's Jason's going to be waving at me to. So we're going to go to a clip now, and then uh, Keith's got the floor. And this is a clip from. It's from down your way. I, mean, I know the forest has its own dialect. Uh, I mean, you know the dialect. Can you sort of tell us a story in it as an illustration? Well, uh, the dialect, uh, there's two old cronies at the funeral of their mate. Mm -hmm. They looked down at the coffin and one said, hmm, I see him was 80 vorsary, oh, old Bislow. Mm, said, I be 84 too. How old be she? Well, I be 83 and a half. It's hardly worth going home, is it? <laughs> Go, going home? Going home. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lovely story. And now, in addition to your books, I know you've written a poem or so about Cinderford. Can you just tell us the poem you wrote about Cinderford? Born in iron, bread and coal, nursemaid grim of earthy soul, Roughly used and left forlorn, a forest maid all unadorned. Patient on ridge which greets the day, she strives to wipe the stains away. And as she ponders what to wear, the southwest breezes braid her hair. West wind brings her perfume sweet from fragrant forest at her feet. In new robes, regal, neat and clean, this maid could be the forest queen. 
Oh, that's lovely. Well written. <laughs> Great mm, poem. Thank you. A very nice start to our programme. Keith. Oh, sorry. My turn, is it? Yeah. 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 Does that sound all right? The interesting thing, or the difficult thing about going third, you spend the first half of the evening scribbling out half of your notes. <laughs> it's quite late in his life that um, I first met Harry, uh, long after he retired. Uh, I first got to know Harry, and uh, that was when I struck up a big friendship with him. I had listened to him without really appreciating who he was back in the 1970s when I used to play football for Coford Football Club, and he came along to their annual dinner dance and did some entertaining, doing uh, a lot of the old forest tales in Forest dialect, and it's the first time I'd ever heard it. And that was back in the 1970s. I never heard him after that period until I got to know him uh, later on in life. It was no doubt our joint interest in the humor of the Forest of Dean, the traditions of the Forest of Dean, and, uh, that, and the dialect that drew us together. Now, Harry was writing long before me, and it was the publication of my own collection of poems, many, as I said, which were in dialect, that drew his attention to me. And he encouraged me to write and, and, did, and to support the forest dialect. And certainly that the publication of Harry's first book, Forest Humour, got me interested in writing in dialect. Nobody else had done it before, to my knowledge, although I think Harvey had done it to a certain extent. We went on... Very often we shared platforms with other forest writers for concerts and one thing or another. Winifred Foley, the late Dr. Tandy, Dick Bryce, the late Edna Healy, and uh, Joyce Latham and others. And then in 1981, some of us all met up to make a recording of Forest Talk at the Angel Hotel in Coford. It's the uh, only copy of the 12-inch RP Forest Talk, Forest of Dean Songs, Poetry and Humour. And that was recorded at the Angel Hotel in Coford. An interesting thing about that record, if you listen very closely, you can hear a flush being poured. <laughs> <laughs> Harry had a lovely, dry, self mocking, perhaps, um, very, very dry, very humorous, but never malicious sense of humor which really sums up the humour of the Forest of Dean in general. And I was going to tell you about the instructions he gave to somebody coming, trying to find the Forest of Dean from Gloucester. <laughs> That's already been done. <laughs> but I would like to read you one of his dialect poems, and this one I love it, it's called, it's called um, A Christmas Carol. It's always been the practice here, since long Varai was born, our band to play around the streets on every Christmas morn. Thy aim so I have been a farm to bring the folks good cheer. But from my observations, there are main objections at beer. When they to start at breakfast time, they are bent ver off the tune. But, the, but they to take some sticking by middle afternoon. Our village ain't so very big, they hear each tune I play. And then their tunes get on the nerves long for it is middle day. But I be not one to grumble, for when all is said and done, a rainfall every Christmas day is due to every man. While well, these year Christmas morning I was standing by my door, having my first Christmas drink and paving the way for more. I heard a band playing just down below the barn, and now I see them struggling up their bands beneath their arms. They strode along in twos and threes and varmed up in the square, just opposite the rising sun to play a carol there. But just far they got started, who should come riding by? But Billy White from Blakeney Hill, him with a gammy eye. Him was out a street, a little mare, as short as her were round. And as Billy's legs was rather long, him fit dragged on the ground. And then I got five horses, a stringy-looking band, 
Their altars had him gathered up and were holding him one hand. I thought it looked a bit risky. He hadn't got much out. If them five trail behind him made up their minds to bolt. But Billy Malice reckoned. I'd boasted we some pride that any oss that went on legs in back that him would ride. He meowed to I as I went by, a Merry Christmas, mon. Get up, you beggar, shifty fit. Go on, old girl, come on. Now lick their band had just got set and ready to begin. And at full blast they started up, let arrow angels zing. <coughs> their first few notes I made I jump and mutter a few words. But them their osses in the bunch rose like a flock of birds. Drew gates o'er walls and edges I scattered in a fright. But I didn't skip together much, each went the way him light. Nick Mare reared up right up on end, her vit above her yard, and Bill slipped backwards o'er her tail and landed in the mud. And when her dropped her front legs down and ducked her yard between, and lashed out with her two iron vit and cocked old Billy clean. <coughs> Him just for scrambling to his vit and getting up on end, when them two eels come flying back and cotton in the wind. Him sat back down with another thud, in place him just to sat in. His mouth were open like a gate, who could have put the hat in? Dick Mare there char charged right at Dick Band, lashing out like fun, and making thirty miles an hour or set off or set her yet for one. We gathered round old Billy and got him to the barn. There him sat up and sung his piece, and turned ale smiling marn. Him drunk a pint of parsnip wine and had a longish smoke. For him could see the funny side and treat it as a joke. Big band at last, they just get up. Or er, they tried. Each time they started, I broke down and laughed until they cried. The Ministry of Transport now, I've got a little book. But there's one rule I wasn't find, however art those look. If thee be led leaden horses, and the band is going to ply, then take these extra roll from I and go round the t'other way. <laughs> Harry often drew on the words of an old forest character known to many people as Jolter. Some people think he was a myth, some people actually knew him, but uh, Jolter, I understand, lived in Liberal, and I think he worked at the Waterloo Pit. It was in the same era as Harry, and they may well have come across each other and known each other. Some think that Jolter was a myth, but I came across an early edition of Forest Mercury. It's dated 1932. And looking through it, I found a very interesting letter to the editor, and I'll read it to you. It's called... Ordinary Special Pancakes. Mr. Yuditer, I spell Y-U-D-I-T-E-R. <laughs> Mr. Yuditer, how oh, best old buddy, Merry Christmas to that. Mind you, this was written end of February. <laughs> Merry Christmas to you. Zuri and it cold. Died to say, never come, never come winter. And oh, bent, they bent far wrong. Thee do we one on them, these wick. I get the pancakes all done. I had to a treat the other night. Do I blow the out all right if he's got enough of one? Old Jammy, Jimmy Matterchuck, where did Master Mon to get pancakes as I knowed? Jimmy Zudden had a recipe for making them out of her yard. Ordinary special ones are called them. I wore Jimmy's place when I were making some rexi to have one. I said, I didn't mind like, so I were give I a couple. Or see, I smacking me chops after I get him. So he says, would have another, Mr. Jolter? I said, I didn't mind like, so or get I do a dream more. After I get them, I, or says, I got a few left over as Jimmy Con yet. These better vanish they up as well, Mr. Jolter. I said, I don't mind like, if it's just robbing Jimmy. So I, so I had Dick. Me and old Jimmy had a bit of business to see down, see to down at the old Jovial Colliers. And we had two or three halves of ale, and Jimmy paid for a couple of quarts of cider. And after we settled our business, I come on one. 
I got a crust of bread and cheese and I pickled in it, onion and celery and so much, and I raised upstairs to bed. I waked up in the night, sorry we are pining in my inside with the money. Our missus waked up and fell into I for making a noise. I yelled her I was bad, and her said as if her never knew I any different. <laughs> or an half evil way, I. Shut the bellican, utter said. Anybody you think that was just blatant like this tea dust? What's wrong with her? I told her as I had yet two or three pancakes. Like I you said. I should think they should get the pancakes. They, they must say, take a good other read this. <laughs> get up from here if they cuss and kick quiet. I had to, sorry, I thought that fell. I were bound to keep moving. And when I moved her, her, her head started swearing at I, so I, I waged off downstairs and had me a brevet in the, cup, in the cupboard for someone to raise me. I met with a couple of bottles of stout as the missus to keep for whenever to do the washing. So I guess them in me, and then I thought a bit airy arter. I went back to bed, and Mrs. Wilder fell into me again, and me fit were cold. It costn't do nothing right for some people. <laughs> well, so long, Odin. The next ordinary special pancakes, Jim is the gee I, I be going to mend our pig's cot with him. <laughs> Yours respectably, Joe Jolter. After Harry's wife, Mildred, died, he found things a little harder to live in on his own, and so he decided to go to live with his son in Lincolnshire, where he was to spend the rest of his days. The last time I heard from Harry was in a letter that he wrote to me, and I'd like to read you the latter part of it, because it shows that he still had not lost his sense of humour, and nor his love of the forest. Well, Keith, I was sorry to leave the forest, as you must know, but I couldn't go on living on my own. I don't regret coming to Lincolnshire, and Roy and Kathleen's loving care has put me back on my feet again, but no more solo living. Lincolnshire isn't the forest of Dean, but it's nevertheless beautiful, and I am absorbing and loving this new landscape. The skies too are lovely. Sunrise over the Cotswoods, and sunset over the Welsh mountains will always be with me in memory. But sunrise and sunset over Fenland and the cloud formation in the vast sky are equally memorable. I was chatting to a group of men repairing one of the dikes, and in answer to a, qu a query, I told him I came from the Forest of Dean. A couple looked blank and said that they had never heard of it. The other said he had been there once, a bloody awful place, he said, so you couldn't see the sky. A place called Lidbrook. <coughs> <coughs> so we're looking round on this vast skyscape and remembering Lidbrook, I felt some small sympathy for him. So I told him where I came from, which I lived 800 feet up. I could look over the Severn to the Cotswoods and turn and look over the Y to the Welsh Mountains. And at that height, we weren't short of sky. Well, Keith, once again, congratulations and good wishes to you and Mrs. Morgan. Keep up the good work. Yours sincerely, Harry Beddington. Right. That was the last I ever heard of Harry, or the last correspondence we ever had together. Harry once told me that of all the poetry that I had written, his favorite was one that was written not in dialect, but in the Queen's English. And I understand that it was read at his wife's Mildred's funeral. And I would like to finish by reading it as a tribute to both of them. It's about the time when people like Harry, Mildred and I, and all of you who love the Forest of Dean, can no longer be part of it. And it's called Nature's Harvest. When my eyes no longer see the hills and vales so dear to me, and ears no longer hear birds sing, and gone the perfumes breathe in spring, when legs grow tired of wooded lanes and cease to run from summer rains, and lips no longer talk with pride of this my lovely countryside, then let me lie deep in the earth that to all beauty love gave birth, where eyes no longer shall grow dim and tiredness rule each weary limb. How gently nature treats her own, 
when gathering in each seed she sown, to hold her children now at rest so safely to her mother's breast. Harry died in 1986 at the age of 85, but he will always live on forever in our memory, so long as we have books like this to remember him by. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Um, you can buy one of these. There's a box at the back if you want to. They're, they're ten pounds if you want a copy of the. Uh, Forest Hume. I'm telling you that because I can see David reaching for his wallet. He collects books. He'll buy them all if you don't get in quick. Um, just to, to, to conclude this first half, um, uh, Keith mentioned Jolter, and uh, there's, uh, certainly Jolter wouldn't be as popular if, uh, it, it, as, as he is if it wasn't for Harry Beddington. There's a debate about whether he existed as a person, and Keith alluded to that. Um, but he's certainly become a big part of forest folklore. Um, there's um, there's actually two people here from the Jolter Press who've named their cider after him, and they're as keen as anybody to know who the real Jolter is. So um, Pat and his colleague are at the back there somewhere, so if you get a chance, they'd, they'd love to know. But I did look into the emptiological meaning of uh, Jolter, see if there was a, a, a meaning to that, and uh, I was quite surprised it was commonly used in the 19th century. And I refer you to the 1811 Dictionary of the Vulgar Tongue by Francis Gross. And it says, Jolterhead, yeah, which is the term, and it is used quite a lot in, um, in Victorian literature, was somebody who was dim or stupid, a jolterhead. So you can see how that, that sort of uh, um, part of that persona that's created the jolter person is, is somebody who's actually very smart indeed, but presents as exactly that, somebody who's a little bit dim. Um, so that, so that's, that's, that's some of the origins of, of jolter um, as, as, a, as a term uh, that somebody was um, blessed with as a, as a, as a name. Um, we're now going to have a break, so there's an opportunity for you to, uh, to have a chat. We're going to make it fairly quick because we'd like to be back here um, in about 10 minutes if we can. And if you haven't drunk your drink, you're welcome to bring it back um, uh, uh, if you want to. But we want to crack on because I know the, uh, the players at the back are getting uh, warmed up. Uh, they're doing their vocal exercises. Um, they're limbering up. So uh, have a cup of tea and we'll be back in 10 minutes. Thank you. Could we have the producer and director of the play? I think he's in the toilet. Is he? <laughs> So. <laughs> hang on, hang on a minute, Cass. We've got to get the producer and director here. Right, he's coming now. Right, can we have a round of applause for our, our actors tonight? Imagine the scene. Mr. Gab's living room. Fireplace down right, door upright. Window centre rear with table under. Door up left, dresser down left, armchair down right, sofa right, centre to centre. When the curtain rises, Lisa is seen brushing up a fireplace. Jenny Harris, with shawl hung loosely over her shoulders, is perched on edge of sofa, scanning the newspaper. 6,000 run over on the roads in a month. Wow, you wouldn't think there were so many fools in the world. Oh, I don't suppose they done it on purpose. It's them blooming cars, the speed they to go. I reckon they oughtn't make cars that to go faster than 20 miles an hour. <laughs> Oh, did you see Sam as you come in? Aye, I caught sight of him down by the fence, making believe to be doing summit to the post. I'd have reckoned George be rounding him up. How oh, you'd have put up with him and George, I don't know. Hey, what's the matter with George? Ah, George is all right. A bit fiery sometimes, but I was thinking more of Sam than him. It seem hard that you've got to put up with the two of them. 
I mean, we beat him just because he was George's stepbrother. Well, the chap got to live somewhere, and him young so bad. He could be quite handy when him to like. When George to like, you mean? He wouldn't do much if George didn't keep him up to it. It never seemed to be worth his keep. Well, that's my funeral. Sam's all right, and him's welcome to an home here as long as him to behave himself. When I took George, I offered Sam an home, and I haven't regretted it, nor you unlikely to. Well, you'd be easier going than me. He would get on my nerves if him was under my feet all day. Ah, there now, and I thought they got the eye on Sam to marry him one day. What's take me for? I want somebody with some money. Till then, I'd be quite content to look after myself and earn my little bit with my needle. There's nothing like being independent. Woo! A distant crash and shout is heard. Hello, what's that? She moves over to the window. Lisa, peering through the window over Jenny's shoulder. Oh, it's a dog fight, I'd reckon. I can't see nobody. Oh, well, I'll be off to the baker before the baker to come. So long. And she exits right. Oh, tell Sam, if you just see him, to get Vic Wheelbarrow out and start getting that coal in. George will be here soon. Lisa turns and recommences dusting, moving the sofa round into centre position. She pauses to listen as another shout is heard, goes to the door and peers out, but seeing nothing, returns. Lisa! Lisa! Lisa looks up from her dusting, but shrugs her shoulders and resumes, but distant groans and a louder shout of Lisa, Lisa, calls her to go over to the window, from which she turns quickly and moves to the door right. Oh, Lisa, come quick! Before Lisa can answer, Jenny bursts in, supporting Sam, who is groaning loudly, oh. hopping and carrying one boot and sock in his hand. Jenny is carrying Sam's coat over her arm. Whatever is the matter? Oh, Lisa, poor old Sam here has been and got run over. Him's her horrible. Sam groans loudly. Oh. And repeatedly, as Jenny and Lisa help him onto the sofa. Well, who did it happen? Who ran over him? I couldn't dodge him, Lisa. They was on him too fast. Well, he'd have been killed. Twas a miracle, him wasn't. And to hear how they cussed him, shameful, it, I calls it. Who? Who cussed him? And who ran over him? It was the voyeur engine, Lisa. And the captain said it'd serve him right if it'd bust him. I believe they have too. His foot's all smashed up. I'll bet there's lots of bones broke. The fire engine? Does thou mean to tell me thou has been and got run over with the fire engine? Cossonier are coming? Cossonier the bow? I heard the blooming thing all right, and I know it was a fire. So I jumped out into the road to see where the fire was, and they came round the corner alpha leather. They was on I before I could dodge. Well, they was a bigger fool than I thought. Didn't know that bell was to tell thee to get off the road, not on him. Oh, let the chap alone, Lisa Gab. And him so quick on his feet as him used to be. Him can't move so fast with them corns of his. I bet him move quick enough when they're engine it in. Does they say the cat and cussin? Yes, him did, Lisa. Him said I'd spoke the exercisers, I'm at. Him's going to report, I. The artless wretch. They'd have stopped the engine and run back to Sam and was asking him if him was hurt. Poor old Sam here couldn't see nothing and was too winded. But I runned up and I could see him was a bit dazed like. So, with my experience in first aid, I took charge and started searching for the injuries. Him come round quite quick enough when I trod on his poor foot. Him all heard horrible. That captain... When him had finished cussing, Sam shouted, Come on, chaps, Jenny Harris will see to the old fool. And then him said to I, You'll get him off the road, Jenny, him said, else when we come back, we'll run over him proper, and it won't only be his foot. And off they went and left, I with poor Sam. It's a good job I didn't know my first aid. I got his shoe off somehow, and then I cut his sock off. Cut, cut his sock off? What's mean? Lisa grabs the sock and glares at it. What's cutting for? Cousin of pulled off. Yeah, that's all you to know about it. It is a plain as plain in the book that clothes have got to be cut away. Well, it don't seem sense to me. Waste of a good sock, I'd reckon. Pity thee hasn't got a mendin. Well, we mustn't stand arguing here. Let's get this poor chap seen to. Got anything we can put on his foot? I do believe there's some bones broke. 
Him ought to see a doctor. I don't want no doctor, I don't. All I do want is rest. Those better have some put on there at any rate. I'll go and see what I can find. The best thing thee can do, Sam, is to come round and stop with I. I let I see to thee till thou art better. I'll tell thee I do know all about first aid. Wow, that's see, Jenny. Liza mightn't like it. Oh, never mind. Dick Foot of thine to want some attention and it's no novice's job. Now this, you know, I'd be good at first aid. Well, cos and come round here and give it to I. As he see Lisa letting I interfere after I've took the job on, it's better for I to take over straight away and I can't do that while they're here. Old George will be poking his nose in too. I expect George will have a bit to say in any case, I'd reckon. Oh, I want you to arrange round at my place, I can handle him. Lisa returning with a bottle and bandages. Here, this ought to do thee good. What is it? Oh, uh, it's some lotion that George had made up for the old sow. When the stone fell on the wall, off the wall onto her. It's good stuff too. Put her right in no time. I shan't have none of that put on my foot, though, mind. I know it's good stuff, but were they, were, were they there when we put it on her? No. What happened? What happened? You ought to send her go round the next and all her. They cuss her across the severn, and does thee know it fetched all her hair off her? Mind. It done her good, but... I shan't have none of that on my foot. Well, fancy suggesting putting that stuff on the chap. What him do want is somebody to look after him, as to know something about first aid. Well, or a doctor. I tell thee, I don't want no doctor. All I do want is rest. Lisa, as steps are heard outside. Here, George is a-coming. Him will have a bit to say about this. Sam closes his eyes and groans oh. pitifully as George, as George enters right. Oh, you're the best. What about that coal? Come on, get. Hello, what has it been up to? Sam sets up a groaning, horrible to hear. Oh, do shut up, Sam. Anyone would think they was dying. Im's bis gone run over with the voyeur engine. What? Well, of all the silly fools, run over with the voyeur engine. George strides over to the dresser and throws his hat on it, then turning to Sam in rising anger... What's mean by getting them over for any road? I suppose they know that a load of coal was come. Or they would have got to get it in, foot or no foot. George walks towards foot of sofa and Sam groans loudly again and repeatedly. Shut the racket. All those want is a bit of exercise. George grabs the foot and shakes it. Sam lets out Ow. an unearthly yell and nearly faints. Oh, you cruel wretch. Let the chap alone. Him's really hurt. Yeah, it must be. I thought it was just putting on to get out of getting that coal in. Sorry, old buddy. I didn't know thee foot with that bad. Though mind him do were horrible. I believe there's some bones broke. Ooh. Well, let's have a look at them. Move round under the thick light a bit. George starts feeling the foot, none too gently. Sam protesting fiercely. Ow, ow, ow. Thee's better have some put on, Dick, hasn't? Oh, well, I was going to put some of this on, George, but Jenny here don't like the idea. I should think not indeed. You heard what Sam said. It fetched all the air off the old sow. George, taking the bottle and eyeing it. Well, a man got no air on his foot to fetch her off. It soon put the old sow right. Yeah, I, I don't know, George, but just remember how we were hollered. Oh, you kicked up a bit of a fuss, didn't you? Don't say remember how we went round big sty. I didn't think I could move so fast. Anyway, I don't think we'd better put it on, Lisa. We'll get some at my order. There's no need for you to do anything. I can see to her. I've done a bit of first aid in my time, and I'd be quite prepared to see these jobs through. I was going to suggest him come round and stop with me, tell him to get better. What? Well, of all the cheek. Do you think we can't look after him? Oh, I know you could, but we're laid up. How are you going to get all the work done and look after him properly? Look after him properly, is it? What do you want us to do? Wet nursing? Well, him have had a shock. <coughs> what him to need is rest and quiet and some nourishment. What sort of rest and quiet do you think him will have at thy place? Thou cousin keep the young tongue quiet to save the young life, let alone his. And that's a fact. You'll take no notice of them. I'll go round and stir up the fire a bit and put the cakes ready. I'll put a drop of cider to what too. Be by there and rest a bit. I shan't be long. Jenny tosses her head at George and Lisa and hurries out. While of all the tarnation cheek, do her think her can look after thee fathead back better than we? 
Who got something different to that in the back of her head, I'll warrant. Did her say anything to thee, Sam, when her was bringing thee home? Uh, well, her told I, her would look after I, uh, if I go round and stop at her place. Oh, her did, did her? Very kind of her, I be sure. Yeah, her said, her would see I was all right until everything was settled. I don't know what her meant by that, though. Any road. I said I was coming back here first, and I don't particularly want to go round there, Liza. I reckon thee could see to I. Aye. Doesn't worry, Sam. We'll see thou to all right. Then, with inspiration, Lisa looks to Jarge. I know what her's after. Who do you think him's going to get some damages? Damages? I don't reckon I got all the damages I'd have won. <laughs> I demean insurance, fathead. Does see, Jarge? That's it. Well, her got some hopes. Him can't get damages from a fire engine. Oh, can I? Look at my foot. I don't mean you can't get money off the council. Not with Iqbal on the front. They say you had plenty of warning. I don't mean the council. I don't mean from the newspaper. You can get five pounds down and three pounds a week for a broken bone. Is that so? Who told you? Well, the man who'd have come asking us to take the astonisher. And you can get hundreds if you be killed. Wow, what's the, <laughs> what's the good of hundreds if you be jerked? Well... The family can get it. Now, if they'd been killed, George and I would have had hundreds. Hey, how about going back and having another go, Sam? <laughs> I, hope, I hope bet I don't. Any road. How about broken bones? I reckon I got some in me foot. Well, let's have a look at them. George commences examining foot with squeaks and squawks and loud protests from Sam. Ah, <coughs> uh, there don't seem to be anything broke there. It's a pity, but there it is. You should have let him have a good go, Sam, whilst they were at it. Before Sam can reply, Jenny hurries in with a mug of hot cider, a sweeping brush and a shawl, beaming at Sam and ignoring Jarge and Lisa. And she hands the mug to Sam. There now, get thy into thee and slip thee coat on and I'll help thee round. I brought this brush so thee can use it as a crutch. Now, commencing to wrap foot up in shawl, let's put something round thee foot. Sam takes a long drink at the mug and sighs contentedly. These can take thee brush and thee cider, or what have left of it, back. Him ain't coming. That's for him to decide. What about it, Sam? You come on round with me? We got some more cider on the op and some pig fry in the oven. Look here, missus. Do you mind the own business? Sam, just stop here. See, him's one of us. And we don't want my help to look after him. Yes, and if you do want to get any insurance money, go and put your own foot under the Voyer engine. Who's talking about insurance? I be sure I never thought of such a thing. Anyway, if there's any due to an, I'll get it for an, and I'll look after an. Oh, I bet you would. But him ain't coming, see? Wow, George. Lee, shut up. You be stopping here. Lisa can look after thee, and I'll look after the insurance money. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to? But him's coming with me. Hey, Sam? Wow, I could do with some more cider, and I do like pig's fry. Let him go, George. Or I'll soon get tired of him. What's mean? I'll bet thee I don't. How much does thee say that insurance was? Five pounds down and three pounds a week while in bad. I thought that's what it was. <coughs> well, him's stopping you, see, and the money's stopping with him. Let him go, I tell thee. Him can go, but the money needn't. Oh, yes, it will. That money's for looking after him and to get him well again. Well, who's the paper in the name of, eh? It's... Jarge used registered customer and him's what to draw the money. Oh, he say the paper's in Jarge's name? Yes, and it's him what to draw the money, see? Sam, who has by this time got his coat on and the crutch adjusted, rising precariously from the sofa. Come on, Jenny, how about that cider and pig's fry? I hope thee doesn't mind, Jarge, but Liza here will have enough to look after, without I? Uh, Jenny, you've got nobody to look after. Who can see to I? Ah, wait a minute, Sam. Oh, I just thought. I promised to go up tomorrow to help Nancy Edwards pick some shallots. I'd be afraid you'll have to stop here, but... Gathering up mug and disengaging brush from Sam's arm, pushing him back on the sofa, but leaving Shaw. I'll bring thee some cider round in the morning. Jarge and Lisa exchange looks and winks. <laughs> Must you be going, Jenny? On the road, round in the morning, tell old Jones at the paper shop I shall be in to register a claim in the afternoon. Hmm. 
Well, you'll have to get a doctor to stiff a cut, and I don't believe there is any bones broke. Jenny sniffs and exits. What did I say? That's all her wanted. Thee ought to have more sense, Sam. T'd serve thee right if I turned thee out. Oh, d doesn't do that, Liza. I should have come back round after I'd had, had that cider and pig's fry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be jiggered. It ain't the sort of I took him for. <laughs> anyway, get that shawl off. I think there's a way to bait thy foot. George takes, uh, sorry, uh, takes the shawl off and recommences probing. Sam yelping. Ow, oh, ow. I can't find nothing broke. <laughs> We have a go at him, Lisa. Jarge looks speculatively at Sam's foot, then quietly moves over to the fireplace and picks up the poker. Lisa probes and squeezes, much to Sam's obvious discomfort. No, I think you're right, Jarge. Im's puffed up a bit, but I, I can't find no bones broke. If those goes on squeezing like that, they'll break a few of George has by now moved behind Lisa with the poker, walks to the end of the sofa, giving one or two tentative twirls with the poker nearing Sam's foot. These might have well let him, have him break some at Sam whilst he was at it. He'd have been worth suffering for then. We'd rather not suffer at all if those ask me. Sam yells and draws his foot up as Jarge gives an apparently wild swing with the poker, nearly hitting the foot. My, my foot! I was nearly hitting. Oh, did I, Sam? I'd be sorry, I was, I was thinking. Jarge gives the poker another twirl or two. But if they're going to think any more, they'd better put Vic Poker down. What was they thinking about? Vic five pounds. <laughs> How much did they say Bill Powell wanted for Vic motorbike, Sam? Oh, uh, only three quid, George. It was a good bike, too. I wish I'd got three quid. Oh, I wish they had. Now, if that bone there... Indicating the foot with the poker, Sam withdraws with a yelp. Oh. What's the matter with thee? I never touched thee. As I was saying, if that bone there had been broke... You'd have had three quid, and then me could have had that mic, and it couldn't have hurt any more. Well, what's the good of saying that now? It's too late. Is it? I was just thinking a tap with Vic Poker would put thee right. Kip the poker to thee, salve. All oh, right, all right, keep the air on. I was only thinking those wanted Vic Bike. Yes, I do, but he mind that poker come hard. I shouldn't, George. Those might hurt him. Besides, somebody might find out. Well, they wouldn't know twas I. Nobody would know anything about it. They mind I should. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't hit the yard, Sam. Do you think of that bike? Yes, do you think of that bike, Sam? George won't hurt that, eh, George? We don't know so much, Liza. It ain't your foot. Oh, doesn't be such a babby. It only hurt like having a tooth out, quick and over. We shut the eyes a minute. It'll soon be over. George spits on his hands. Oh, I, I couldn't, George. I couldn't stand it. George swipes quickly with the poker, but Sam draws his foot up and George misses. Why doesn't he keep the foot still? It'd have been over by now. Lisa, grabbing Sam's leg and straightening it out. Let I owe thee leg, Sam. And she signals to George to strike. Sam, however, with a howl, draws oh. his leg up again and George misses again. Keep still, Cossant. How can they meet thee if he's going to wiggle about like that? Here, George, thou hold him and let I hit him. Lisa takes the poker from George and moves round to the head, to front of sofa, making play by licking her palms in turn to get a good grip on the poker. George, meanwhile, moves quickly up to press Sam back onto the sofa with one hand and grabs just above foot with the other. Lisa whacks hard, but hits George's hand. George lets go and stamps back down to the end of the sofa, round to the front and across to the front head. Lisa edges back behind the sofa, holding Sam down, both watching George anxiously. He has, meanwhile, been raving and stamping with pain. Why didn't he keep thee blooming for it still? Or have nearly broke thee wrist? It would serve thee right if we wouldn't do it for thee. Those needn't do it, George. Those needn't. I never ex thee too. Shut thee racket. Here, give I thick poker. George grabs the poker from Lisa, jabs Sam hard in the stomach with it. Sam doubles up. Foot forgotten for the moment, then George whacks the foot good and hard. There. Oh, me foot, me foot. I be jarred, I be jarred. They was done in an injury, George. I heard the bones crack. Oh, him will be all right in a minute. <laughs> you go and get him some cider. Oh, and bring the clean form while we be at it. Shut you out, I never hurt thee. 
Beat thing to take bike. They will have three pounds now. Yeah. Charge, taking some notes from his pocket, peeling off three and pressing them into Sam's hand. There's three quid. There, that'll make you feel better. Sam begins to come round, looks at the three notes and smiles feebly. There, what do I tell thee? That wasn't so bad after all, was it? I just took that very well, old buddy. Yeah, I, I reckon I did. Mind, there ain't many could have stood it like that, George. There ain't old un, hardly a whimper. And that weren't a bad pat I gave thee. It wasn't thee, mind. My foot do seem to have gone a bit numb-like. Oh, the feeling will come back in a minute or two. Lisa appears with cider and claim form, hands mugged to Sam, who drinks deeply and gratefully. Yeah, thee get that into that. That'll soon put it right. I reckon thee's earned it. Jarge takes the form from Lisa and begins to examine it. Lisa moves to the foot of the sofa, looking anxiously at Sam's foot. Oh, is him? Is him all right? I reckon those broke a few bones then. Cousin of it him a little bit lighter. Oh, nothing like doing a job all right. Him's all right, eh, Sam? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I'd be all right, Liza. I'd reckon there ain't many would have stood it like that. Uh, what's thee think? There ain't, Sam. Thee drink that up and I'll get thee some more when that's gone and when we filled up the form. Thee, let I wrap my foot up. Oh, him to look awful. We'll have to send for a doctor. George, who has been studying the form carefully. Yeah, half a minute, Liza. We haven't finished yet. Liza moves over to examine the form with George. What? What do you mean? Jarge, tapping the form with the poker. While it to say here that the brake's got to be above the ankle. <laughs> Sam hopping round to the head of the sofa, which he grabs whilst he stares round anxiously at them both. What? What's the matter with ye? Do you mind I be off? Where be thee off to? I be off to see a man about a bike. <laughs> We've got another recording which we wanted to finish with, um, but we may have to abridge that because we're, we're pressing on with time. But we have, um, we have, we ha we really want to make the most of the opportunity to have a discussion, really, about Harry Beddington. Um, Keith's come back. Is Doug coming back? Where's Where's Doug gone? Oh, he's here. Yes, yeah, good to have you out here, Doug, because you you're another person that knew him. Um, and I wonder where we'd like to start with that. Has anybody got a question that they'd like to put or? Um, you know, anything they'd like to say about Harry? Is there, is there anybody here who'd like to just perhaps open up a discussion for us? Yeah. Well, there's certainly all roads point to Lidbrook and the Waterloo Colliery. There was somebody around who obviously full, you know, was known as Jolter, so that, that's certainly the case. If you do find a name, then do let us know. There's a few people out there scouting for one, but if you, if you get one, let us know. Okay, anything else? Without putting you on the spot, um, as relatives of Harry, do you think we've done him justice if we got close to the man tonight <laughs> yes um, yeah can, can we get, have a microphone yeah I'll just say just say <coughs> hello can you hear me um, first of all say to the thank you to the wonderful people of the forest never before and probably never again will we be invited to sit in the front row uh, which we've done tonight, and uh, thank you very much for that. Now, um, um, Uncle Harry, um, I'm um, his wife, Mildred's brother, is my father. That's the relationship. Um, and we always used to go to 119 Bellevue Road uh, uh, round about Christmas, and, uh, and many other times as well. So. Um, the, 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 the thing about um, Uncle Harry was uh, two, uh, two main things. One was uh, uh, the love of the forest and the love of his family. Those two things really um, governed his life. From, uh, from Bellevue Road, 
uh, looking out the window, the other side of the road. He, he was on the going up hill. He, uh, the house was on the right hand side and looking out beyond was a wonderful view over the forest. And that was his pride and joy. And we always went there and enjoyed the view with him. Um, uh, and uh, it was always uh, such a welcoming household and uh, always so interesting. Never a dull moment when we were there, both with him and the rest of the family. Um, he had one or two um, uh, things which he was perhaps less uh, proficient at, uh, his gardening, but the one thing that he grew with any um, success was radishes, uh, and he would talk about his radishes um, uh, on many occasions. And the other one was his driving. Um, he, he came to uh, where we live in Herefordshire, and there was a narrow lane there, and he touched the, he had a, ca a car fairly late in life, and he touched the side of the car uh, against the wall, and the whole length of, must have been 20 yards or so, he scraped his way against the wall from the beginning to the end. Um, what I uh, found out, just two other things uh, that I, uh, I particularly remember about um, uh, visits to um, 119 Bellevue Road was, um, uh, uh, one was at Christmas, and, and this was really relating to the food that was on the table. There would always be, it was quite a small dining room, and a lot of us there for, for Christmas. And uh, there would be things like sandwiches on the table, and uh, um, we would always be invited to have as much as we wanted uh, and asked if we'd had enough. And we never knew if, if that was all that was there to have, so we used to fill up with sandwiches. And then after we'd done that, they used to bring in the cakes from, from, the, from the kitchen, uh, which we were, were then too full to eat. Uh, <laughs> and um, one other thought, um, I became aware that I was getting very slightly educated uh, when we were at uh, Bellevue Road, and that is that um, they would always talk uh, about so-and-so, and, -so and um, he told him to B-U-double-G-E-R off, and it was when I, could, when I could work that out for myself, I realized I was growing up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I think um, your three cousins, um, uh, uh, one of them has recently died, I was, I was sad to read. Yeah, yeah, that was very sad. And the, the other two are surviving, yeah? Yes, the other two are surviving. Uh, one, the, young, the younger John, has done very well. He was for five years chief government scientist. Yeah. At Leeds United. Um, yeah. So, um, clearly under his father's influence, mm. uh, he's, he's done very well in life. Yeah, this is uh, Sir John Beddington, and he, he I, th I believe he had a chair at uh, Oxford or Cambridge, and he's an advisor on climate change, I believe. Yeah, yeah he's, he's only recently stopped doing that as a government advisor. And I know uh, Jason's had correspondence with him, and he's been very supportive about... Um, this program and, and Jason's interest in his career. I think he's got a daughter who's an, or, or an author in Belgium, I think. She lives in Belgium or Paris. Um, so so the, the family have sort of moved on, haven't they? It's quite interesting. I think he's president of London Zoo. Is he? <laughs> yeah, I wonder what Harry would think of that. Yeah, that's very good. That's very good, but thank you for that contribution. Keith, were you, do, were you just stretching or were you going to... Did you want no, to say? <laughs> <laughs> One interesting comment I saw talking to a young lady in Covert today who lives in Sandiford somewhere. I said, oh, I said, I'm doing a talk tonight on Harry Bennington. You come in? She said, oh, what time does it start? I said, 7.30. She said, oh, EastEnders is on then. <laughs> <laughs> ah, well. <laughs> we can't win them all now, Eric. We can't. We can't. Yeah, Forest Enders. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay. We go, any other questions or comments people would like to make? Is there any more we can? Uh, 
Yeah. So on the dialect thing, somebody was commenting at uh, in the break. We were talking about, um, I, and I, I don't know whether Keith thinks this is true, but that the, the the dialect was different. I mean, the several people said that you could tell before the Second World War, you could tell which village people came from because of the 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 way they used dialect. Is that true, Keith? Or were you around before the Second World War? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Then I think. Yeah. Do you think that's true, though? There was that. Oh, sort certainly, of... yeah. It, it, it does vary from um, from one area of the forest to another. I, I told a story on Radio Gloucester on Sunday morning. When I was advertising this show. As a person was explaining to an old old man how the dialect changed from one area of the forest to another, and she said to him, "It's, it's all about the vowels. The vowels are different." He said, "The vowels? What do you mean? The vowels are different?" <laughs> so was you know they're, they're different from one end of the forest to the other. Said the vowels, said, yeah. So they all say cock a doodle doo, don't them? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's. So what, well, Eric, if people at the back can't catch it, it without the microphone, Eric said there was a chap called Bert Ayland who uh, did dialect uh, uh, verse and humour, Jolter in particular, and he, uh, he also had a dance band. Um, picking up on that, of course, uh, Keith said earlier that one of the recordings we have, we haven't used tonight, is, uh, is uh, Harry Beddington reading F.W. Harvey's um, uh, um, dialect poems, and they really are, again, very funny. Um, he, he, uh, uh, there's several dialect poems and uh, they're, they're, they're really excellent and the, the recording shows that Harry was a great admirer of F.W. Harvey because he actually talks about him and the men of Minsterworth so there was a continuity there and thinking ahead, obviously we've got Keith who's still writing and performing poetry um, and we've got Maggie Clutterbuck who's, who's hiding there who's... Uh, you know, who is who, doing dial, dialect work as well, dialect poetry. Um, so, so there's still, you know, there's still life in dialect poetry. Is there anybody else, Keith, I've missed who's who's actually performing in dialect or writing in dialect now? You over there? <coughs> yeah, who's that? Kath. Kath. Kath Smith. Smith. Yeah, She's yeah, because I know at the Faddle you have people enter. She was the first forest bard in, chosen by the uh, Forest Faddle. Excellent. Very good. Yeah, welcome, Kath. That's good. And you, have you got a publication people could look at if they wanted to? Not at the moment. They've all gone. <laughs> okay. Well, look forward to some more because it's it's a you know I think it's a really important uh, um, source of particularly poetry and verse as an expression. So we look forward to seeing more. And the faddle is a great way of sort of encouraging that, Keith. So. Well done with that. Mm. Um, any other comments or observations? There was a um, lady mentioned among people who done poet, dialect stuff and written books. And my memory is uh, not working very well tonight, but t I, I recognised it as soon as her name was said. And uh, mm. she died about 15 years ago, probably. Um, she wrote one or two books. What, what Joyce Latham is somebody we'll have to have one of these evenings about because we've had lots of people contact us about her books and her life. Um, you know, she's a very interesting person and very well remembered as well. Um, I think we're getting to the sort of the, the point where I don't want people to be late leaving and uh, the library have got to shut up. We've got one last recording. Um, I, it's, it, 
Jason, it's it's according to my notes, um, it's it's about ten minutes long. Um, if people can bear with us for the ten minutes, if they feel they want to go, if you feel you want to go, then please head off. We're going to end with this recording, so it's incumbent upon me just to to finish off with a few more thank yous for the library staff in particular, um, for our for our actors in, who have been fantastic. That's Rachel and Sarah, Lee and Jeremy. Um, they're still here. And I think uh, Jason and Rachel's children have been here supporting them as well, so they're at the back somewhere. But thank you ever so much for that performance because they put a lot of effort into that. And uh, Dane behind me, who's, um, who's uh, been working the sound desk very, very ably. Um, and of course, our, our two important contributors tonight, Keith and Doug, who've, uh, who've added a lot, the family, um, and all of you that have come tonight, because that's been a, you know, you've all contributed to this. We've had some great discussion, um, and it's been a, been a privilege to do three of these sessions. As I say, there's a few people who've been to all three, and they get the medal. Um, you know, they've, they've done it all. So thank you very much, and thank you very much. Have a good journey home. Um, oh, you know, he's good, isn't he? He's good, he's really good. Keeps an eye on me. Uh, feedback forms, uh, if you could fill those in. Perhaps if you, if you listen to the recording, you could just fill those in before you go. There's some pens around. Um, it's always helpful, because this is, I should, we, we haven't really promoted the university. We're, we're also contributing to this with uh, the Foresters Forest. Um, so uh, it all goes back to the university, and it helps them think about supporting things like this. Right, while you do that, as I say, if you have to leave, because it's now quarter past nine, we're just going to have a few minutes of Harry Beddington to end on. Thank you very much. Just down to west of Severn, and lying east away, with seven million treetops reaching for the sky, there the dear old forest of Dane peacefully delay, and of all the places on these earth, that's the place for I. You may have been told that they're a bit rough up there. Well, as the forester will say, though try living amongst them trees, see if thou doesn't grow a bit of bark somewhere. <laughs> but chunt the bark is the matter, as Jimmy White told the postman. The postman said to Jimmy, So, Mr. White, I don't going to bring your letters any more. They why not, me boy? Was a dick dog of yourn. Every time I'd have come draw the gate, him to bark and bark and bark. Said they'd be glad him do me, boy, because one of these days when him a got a chops full of thy leg, they'd wish to God him a kept on barking. <laughs> but they can be rough. The old lady went to the football match, Cinderford playing bream, and the skin and hair were flying in all directions. She looked at her daughter and said, Golly, bent they rough. How often do a man get killed at these games? The linesman looked up at her. Only once, missus, only once. <laughs> but they do have an odd way of expressing themselves up there. There's the old chap giving his son a bit of advice. Said, so, my boy, I'd be afraid thou was on the wrong road. So those main feather was that them winches those kept going out we. Those have a fresh in every wick. So why doesn't stick to one? There's putty in mind of a butterfly, flitting round from flower to flower. Though mark my words, my boy, though one of these days out quat on a thistle. <laughs> and sure enough, he did quat on a thistle. He met one of those girls, you met him, got a tongue like a pup's tail, never still a minute. And when he used to go home at night, she used to let into him about something or other. And he just let her get on with it and look out through the window and get on with his tea. This one night she finished up pounding the table, said, they're the best. I've been talking to thou for now on ten minutes, and I don't believe thou heard the word as I said to thou. Him said, well, shut thee chops a minute and let's hear what they was talking about. <laughs> then there was the old chap whose wife persuaded him to go to church. He hadn't been for years. And when he got there, the minister was preaching from the last chapter of Revelation all about heaven and the pearly gates. And he quite enjoyed it. So he went again the next Sunday, and they were on about the same subject, all about the streets paved with gold. But the next Sunday he didn't attempt to get ready. His wife said, Bisson, thou come into church tonight? I said, I bent. I said, why not? Thou enjoyed it the last twice, didn't? 
I said I did, but to tell you the truth, think their parson is a bit of a hypocrite. Was it else make that out? Was it these no old women telling we how lovely it is up in heaven? Is it I? Was it last Thursday I was in the grind down the middle of the road, humming to himself and swinging his umbrella? Said Fred Watkins lorry come whipping round the corner. If thou send the why him up on the pavement, him didn't aim to go there. <laughs> And their humour sometimes can be a little bit on the grim side and down to earth. There's the two old chaps at the funeral of their mate. Looking down, hmm, I see him was 84, sir. How old is he? Maybe 84, too. Yes, I said. I be 83 and a half. It's hardly worth going one, is it? <laughs> the, Chap went to see his mate in hospital, and when he got there, his mate was really down in the dumps. Said, oh, be sold on the horse, that don't mind, I be bad. So I reckon I be going to die. Well, I said, they just not want to worry about that. Said, there's nothing to it, really. I was only feel a bit stiff next day. <laughs> <laughs> the old chap who the doctor put on... Uh, a light diet. All he could have was slops and gruel, and he hated this stuff. But the doctor kept him on it for two or three days, and he got hungrier and hungrier. But his wife wouldn't let go. Anyway, the doctor came in and said he was certainly a bit better. So he thought he could improve his diet. Turned to the wife and said, I think you can cook him a little chicken. Said, they're the best judge. They're so here with him said, thou could have a little chicken. What is so like I just stuff them we? Said we a bigger on. <laughs> the old lady went to the doctor with the arthritis in her knee. And he said, let's have a look at this. So she showed him her knee. Good gracious woman, he said. That's the dirtiest knee I've ever seen in my life. So I get on with her. There's many worse than Nick. He said, I'll bet you five shillings that's the dirtiest knee in England. Said though Basan. Have a look at Dick. I never wish, Dick. <laughs> well, of course, they like, their, they like their little jokes. And the biggest joker of all is Jolter. Old Jolter, one night he dreamt he was dead. When he woke up in the morning and saw the blind down, he thought it was true. So he went and put his best suit on to go to the funeral. <laughs> And the foreman sent him to fetch a wheelbarrow. Back came Jolter with two, wheeling one inside the other. So what's bring two for? I only told the to fetch one. I ain't know the distance said, but don't just expect I to bring in, just expect I to carry in. <laughs> and he was in butties with his mate in the pit. Jolter was in charge of the day shift and his butty in charge of the night shift. When he got in this one morning, there was a broken shovel leaning against the side, and chalked across the blade was a message. Take these out, Zuri, I've forgotten. <laughs> when his mate came that night, the shovel was still there, but the message had been altered. It now read, though taking out this elf, I am hidden. <laughs> <laughs> and he came down into Colford one summer evening, and there was the harvest moon shining up, all lovely, round and golden, and he looked at it in wonder. And two little boys came up to him. Say, mister, can you tell us, is that the moon or the sun up there? George said, I'm sorry, boys, I can't tell you. I don't live about here. I be from Lidbrook. <laughs> and back in the war... They used to have the searchlights shining up around the hills, and it used to be a favorite occupation to go and stand and gawk at these lights, all shining up into the darkness as solid as a candle. They were gawping up at this one, and one nudged daughter said, Let's see the claim up there, Surrey. He looked at the light and looked at the soldiers working it. So, <laughs> but though I don't, I know them. They'll let I get halfway up, and then they'll shut and all. <laughs> But he wasn't so daft. They used to say about Jota that if you offered him the choice between a penny and sixpence, he'd always choose the penny because it was the largest. The mate said to him once, why does thou always choose a penny? 
Doesn't thou know the sixpence? It was six of them. I know that, you fool, in said. But if I was to choose six their sixpence once, I wouldn't give away the chance no more. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the forester values education a lot. But he's lived too long in the woods to be frightened by owls. And he can tell a cuckoo a mile away. And he knows very well that stuff in the yard with knowledge won't stop the ears of growing if thou be a long-eared sort. <laughs> if thou carry the yard too high in the clouds, or the nose too high in the air, thou'd miss a lot of lovely things thou'd never know be there. But if thou grovel in the dust, and humbly take thee place, them at the top, and it'll serve the right, or walk right over thee face. So whoever the best, whatever the job, and whatever might be the objective, stand up on the vit and look out square, and find the true perspective. The people of the forest of Dean, they are a race apart. A little rough and ready, but not so bad at heart. They'll slap you on the shoulder, or clip you on the jaw, however you are asking for it. It won't worry them at all. They'll watch till they are certain which way you'll have it be. Then, same as you are treating them, that's how they'll treat thee. Thank you.